Page 566, Great Britain. Okay, Great Britain. While the rest of the continent was involved in revolution, Great Britain had a relatively tranquil time on it. There were about three big reasons for this. Reason number one was the Reform Act of 1832. The Reform Act of 1832 took power away from the nobility and gave almost all of the power to the House of Commons. Now, Britain kept its nobility. Britain kept its queen. But the king, or in this case, uh, the king who was in charge in 1832, King William, um, let his power all be taken away in favor of giving it to the prime minister. So from that time to this, the prime minister has been the real power in Britain as far as, um, you know, being the one man who's in charge, not the king, but the prime minister. And the House of Lords still exists. There are still dukes, there are still counts, there are still barons, viscounts, but they have no real authority. So the Reform Act of 1832 gave most of the power to the House of Commons. Most of the power to whom? The House of Commons. All right, Britain has two houses like we do, the House of Lords and the House of Commons, but the House of Commons has all the power. The House of Lords basically is just a mere figure. They, don't, they can't do anything as far as governing, just like the Queen of England. She can't do anything as far as governing, but she's merely a figurehead. And I was asked more than once, why does Great Britain choose to keep the Queen tradition? They've always had a king. They read about their kings in their history books, and they want them, I guess they want to have a king and a queen now. So uh, they still have their queen. Now, another reason for Britain's stability was economic growth. Their economy continued to grow throughout this period. And the average person found he had more opportunity in Great Britain than anywhere else in Europe. So a person could rise up economically. He was not put down by the system. Not as much in, in Britain as he was in, in other places. Another reason that Britain didn't experience revolution was due to the influence of Queen Victoria. Okay, I can see if some of you are hot. I just got an email about the heat in the building. The air conditioning is not working in this building. And they're working on it, which is something we can do about it. So I'm sorry about the heat, but hopefully that will be fixed shortly. All right. Anyway, Queen Victoria. She has reigned, uh, as of this moment, she ruled Britain for longer than any of Britain's monarchs. 1837 to 1901, 64 years. Our present queen, the great-great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria, Queen Elizabeth II, has been on the throne 61 years. If she can last three more years, she'll equal her great-great-grandmother. If she can last four more years, she'll break the record. Uh, Queen Victoria's mother, by the way, Queen Elizabeth, lived to be 101. If Queen Elizabeth II lives that long, I mean, not Queen Victoria, but Queen Elizabeth's mother lived to be 101. Her name was uh, Elizabeth also. Queen Elizabeth's mother lived to be 101. So if Queen Elizabeth II lives as long as her mother did, she will shatter Queen Victoria's record. Queen Victoria, again, her, she was so popular that her reign has been called the Victorian era, and the people of Britain were quite proud to be one of her subjects. Now, on a personal note, Queen Victoria married, had a few children, and then abruptly and unexpectedly her husband died. And this led to a little characteristic of the Victorian era that your book doesn't mention, but the Victorian era is known for its hush, hush, we don't mention that attitude towards sex. After all, the Queen wasn't doing it, so uh, we don't want to mention it. The Victorian era is the only era in history that has a whole line of poetry 
that can be read by children. Um, again, the Queen, the Victorian era somewhat influenced my generation. I have a first cousin whose mother grew up late in the Victorian era, and he can tell you that one day in a conversation he used the word pregnant, and his mother slapped him across the face. And, don't do that, that's illegal. Stop <laughs> that out. We don't talk that way around here. Um, this actually happened. He said pregnant? He used the word pregnant in a conversation. And his mother stopped because of faith. But see, again, my grandmother, who uh, was born in 1895, was, was about eight years before Queen Victoria died, well, no, about six years before Queen Victoria died, was highly influenced by Victoria. And uh, again, sex was a taboo subject. Hush, hush, we don't mention that. Now, when I was younger, we talked about the Victoria. Oh, yeah, in the, during the Victorian era, Women didn't have legs, they had limbs. Um, and everything about a female anatomy was covered up. Uh, again, this was the way that they um, believed that women should dress. Uh, everything covered except for their face and maybe their hands, and oftentimes they even wore gloves on their hands. Um, completely covered. Now, folk, fast forward a little bit to 2014. This attitude is fast coming back in our world today, you might say, really, well, I'll tell you something in a workplace book. If you're a man, hush, hush, you better not mention that. I spent 27 years at Lockheed, and I can name you some men who got fired for what's called sexual harassment. And I can tell you about a friend of mine who, he, this didn't happen at Lockheed, but it happened after he got laid off from Lockheed, doing a big layoff. He came into work one day, like any other day, and he was stopped by security at the parking lot. And the security told him he was fired for such harassment. Well, he called into his boss, who was a female who had hired her, and said, What's the matter? What's going on? She said, Several women have complained about you, and we terminated him. What did he actually say? What he admitted to saying, he would say such things as, That's lovely makeup you have on, or That's a lovely blouse you have on. But what they said, he said, was so bad, I'm not going to repeat it here. Now, when I said I gave this story out, one pupil said I would fight it. Let me tell you men something. Something like this is extremely difficult to fight because these women had ganged up on him and they would join together in witnesses, and it was his word against theirs. All right. Do you make a point? I mean, this this actually happens a lot of places in the workplace. Again, in the, the workplace. Um, all right, and again, the Victorian era, um, as soon as Queen Victoria died, the women started dressing in bathing suits on the beaches, and uh, uh, a lot of, of course, uh, yeah, a lot of things changed pretty fast after she died. But while she was alive, her influence did a lot to promote somewhat extreme modesty. All right, so much for the Victorian era. Um, well, one other thing I must say about uh, Britain, they had two main prime ministers, Disraeli and Gladstone. I promise you I'm not going to um, ask them on the test, but I uh, think they at least deserve mention. The politics during this time went back and forth, back and forth, between Disraeli, who was a Jew on one side, and Gladstone, who was another. And I want, yeah, I must say this. I mean, I know this school's a middle Jewish community, but most, some people believe that one reason Britain prospered when the rest of Europe didn't. There was a strong anti-Jew sentiment on the continent that was not shared in Great Britain. Great Britain treated its Jews better than most other places in Europe, and which may have contributed a lot to the prosperity of Great Britain at the expense of the prosperity of the rest of Europe. Now you can take that for whatever you wish to. Um, Anti-Semitism has become so strong that it led to the Holocaust of the 1940s, which we will talk about later. In fact, I'm going to have much more to say about uh, did I? Yeah, I meant uh, anti-Semitism. Now that I've used the word, I'm going to tell you what is anti-Semitism. I mean, I've, I've got most of my students don't seem to know, but you'll you'll run into it throughout your life. Anti-Jew, the hatred for Jews. We'll run into this term next chapter, so I'll introduce it to you now. Anti-Semitism. The word comes from, hey, of all places, Shem, 
the son of Noah, who was the ancestor of the Jews. Again, if you, uh, that's, uh, it was anti, anti uh, Shemism or anti Semitism, hatred for Jews. Uh, Britain did not share in it, and again, some people believe that led to prosperity with Britain. All right, leaving Britain for a while, hey, again, we could spend an entire semester talking about Britain in the 1800s, Victorian era Britain. There are college courses offered in it, uh, graduate level courses, 18th, I mean, yeah, 1800s, Victorian era Britain. But we have to move on. France. Now, unlike Britain, France experienced revolution on top of revolution. Revolution in 1830, revolution 1832. Again, for more info, uh, see yesterday's lecture on the I College Night, where I talk about it in some detail. But the year 1848, now I keep being asked, how many dates do I just remember? Well, the ones I write down. Year 1848 is known as the year of revolutions. The revolutions Europe experienced always began in France, and through the one in 1848. It ended with the overthrow of France's last king, and Napoleon III, who was nephew of Napoleon I, taking over. Napoleon III took charge in 1848. He was not like his uncle. He did not engage in a big program of conquest, but instead he engaged in trying to build up France and was popular at first. For 12 years, 1848 to 1860, the people liked him. He modernized the city of Paris, put up wide avenues, replaced the crooked streets, his reasoning was that the crooked streets made it easy for revolution and revolutionaries to come in and sneak in upon the palace. But he reasoned if he put wide straight streets, the revolutionaries would not have as good a place to hide. Uh, he expanded industrial growth, constructed railroads, even built harbors, canals, roads. Most of the major French railway lines that we have in France today were started during his reign. Okay, your book does mention the narrow streets were destroyed and replaced by modern Paris of broad boulevards, spacious buildings, circular plazas. They improved the sewage system and put up street lights of gas. This was before the electric light bulb was invented. Well, make a long story short, another date I remember is the year 1870. Napoleon went to war against Germany in what's called the Franco-Prussian War. The French believed they could easily defeat the Germans. So they engaged, the Franco-Prussian War was a quick war. One battle, bang, and it's over. And France had lost miserably. After the end of the Franco-Prussian War, Napoleon's government fell to pieces. And finally, France, who had been promised democracy as long ago as 1792. They were promised democracy in 1792, promised it again in 1830 in 1832, but finally in 1870, France got its democracy. It took many, many years. 